in the last step of our metabolism of carbohydrates, we are going to consider today the tricarboxylic acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. Now, if we look at the three stages of cellular respiration, there are actually the first stage that we have gone through that is glycolysis for acetyl coenzyme A production. We will see, we have already seen the breakdown of glucose to pyruvate and we will see now how pyruvate actually gets to acetyl coenzyme A that then gets into the tricarboxylic acid cycle which eventually leads to the production of carbon dioxide. And we have already considered the third step where we have electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation that leads to the production of ATP. So, these are actually the three stages of cellular respiration and if we consider the catabolic pathways of all the breakdown whether it is amino acids or fatty acids or glucose, they ultimately lead to acetyl CoA which is the key component of the TCA cycle which we will see. So, what happens is what we have studied in glycolysis is glucose getting to pyruvate. Now, the reverse of this is also possible in a process that is called gluconeogenesis where glucose is formed from pyruvate. It is not the exact reverse of the glycolysis steps, but relatively since these involve some of the similar enzymes, we do have the pyruvate getting back to the glucose. So, we also saw how the lactate is formed from the pyruvate. So, we have lactate also getting to pyruvate and amino acids have actually entry points at three points where it can get to pyruvate, you can get to acetyl CoA or you could get directly to the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Fatty acids get into acetyl CoA. Okay? So, we have considered so far the breakdown of glucose to pyruvate. Now, in general, we have these three overall steps, all of them produce ATP. Okay? That is our major concern in the production of energy, production of energy in the form of ATP, which is ultimately going to be used for the breakdown of these high energy phosphate bonds that is going to release a large amount of energy for our bodily functions. So, we have the first step glycolysis where from glucose we get two pyruvic acid molecules. Here we have the Krebs cycle which we are going to study right now and the electron transport that also resulted in the production of ATP. So, these are the three stages that we are going to have. Now, if you look at the two stages that have been mentioned the stage 2 and stage 3, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport, they occur in the mitochondria. Okay? This is the picture of the mitochondria where you can recognize the inner folds called the criste of the mitochondria and this glycolysis step occurs in the cytosol of the cell. Okay? So, this mitochondria is in the cell, the cytosol is where the glycolysis steps occur and here we have in the mitochondria Krebs cycle and electron transport. The electron transport we know occurs in the inner mitochondrial membrane where we have complexes 1 through 4 and the F0, F1 ATPase that creates the ATP from the proton motive force. So, this is what we have done previously where we consider glycolysis, the glucose getting to 2 pyruvate. Okay, we have gone through all these steps, but ultimately glucose is going to be broken down into carbon dioxide and water with ATP. Okay? So, our next step now is to see how pyruvate is going to get to carbon dioxide. This is formed by the Krebs cycle. There, there are three different names to this cycle. It is called the CAC or the citric acid cycle, the TCA or the tricarboxylic acid cycle or the Krebs cycle since it was most of these reactions were determined by Hans Krebs. Now, Acetate in the form of acetyl CoA is derived from pyruvate. So, the key step after the <coughs> after pyruvate is obtained in the breakdown of glucose is the formation of an acetate. This acetate is taken up by coenzyme A to form acetyl CoA and then later on it is oxidized into CO2 in, the, in this citric acid cycle. 
So, what happens is the Krebs cycle actually extracts the energy of the sugar by breaking the acetic acid molecules all the way down to carbon dioxide enzymatically. And the cycle uses some of this energy to make ATP and it also forms NADH and FADH2. FADH2. And later what we are going to see is we are going to see an energy balance and see exactly what is the amount of energy we are going to get from a single molecule of glucose. Okay? Now, in the Krebs cycle, we have these are the key features of the Krebs cycle. We have one high energy compound produced for each cycle. What we mean by a high energy compound is actually GTP, GTP is formed in this case, but a triphosphate bond being formed. Okay? Like in glucose, we had ATP being formed that is the formation of a high energy compound. The electrons from the tricarboxylic acid cycle are made available to an electron transport chain in the form of 3 NADH and 1 FADH2. So, these are also formed in the reactions in the Krebs cycle and this NADH and FADH2 you remember is utilized in oxidative phosphorylation for the production of ATP where we require these cofactors in the complexes 1, 2 and 3 and 4 also. The citric acid cycle you have to remember is central to all respiratory oxidation okay? and it oxidizes acetyl CoA that is obtained from glucose, lipid and protein catabolism. Okay? So, you understand that this acetyl CoA is an extremely important component because it is, the, it is formed from the breakdown not only of carbohydrates, but also of lipids and of proteins. Okay? And the cycle also supplies some precursors for other biosynthetic biosynthesis, for other biosynthetic methods in the formation of proteins and other biological macromolecules. And all these enzymes as I showed in one of the previous slides are in the mitochondrial matrix or in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay? These are for the Krebs cycle. Glycolysis occurs in the cytosol of the cell. Now, this is the major reaction. What we have here is we have pyruvate. Pyruvate is CH3 CO CO minus that is pyruvate. We have here coenzyme A that is we will look at the structure in a moment. NAD plus this goes to NADH and we form acetyl CoA with the release of carbon dioxide. The enzyme for this is pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So, it is a complex of enzymes, actually three enzymes E1, E2 and E3. We will see what those components are in a moment and this is called the PDC, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex that comprises of three enzymes. Now, once acetyl CoA is formed, it does not get back to pyruvate, okay? which makes this reaction irreversible and which means basically that fat actually cannot be converted to carbohydrate because even though you get to the same acetyl CoA because fat breakdown will also get you to acetyl CoA. Okay? S but since acetyl CoA cannot get back to pyruvate, you cannot get back to glucose because pyruvate can go back to glucose in which, st in which process? The st process is called gluconeogenesis. Okay? So, we can get from pyruvate to carbohydrate and had this step been reversible, since acetyl CoA is formed from the breakdown of fatty acids, we should have been able to obtain carbohydrate from fats, okay? but that is not possible due to the irreversibility of this step. Now, this has three enzymes E1, E2 and E3. Now, we will not go into the details of the mechanism or what how the procedure actually takes place, but nevertheless we need to know something about the complex. It has as I have been mentioning E1, E2 and E3. There are 60 copies of E2 in the core of the complex, 30 copies of E1 and 12 copies of E3. Okay? So, you can imagine that this is a huge complex in the way it actually acts. Each of these have their own cofactors associated with it. Okay? So, E1 
is actually pyruvate dehydrogenase that uses TPP as the cofactor. E2 is dihydrolipol transacetylase that is lipoic acid bound and uses coenzyme A as the substrate. So, as soon as we have coenzyme A, we know that we are going to create now acetyl coenzyme A, the acetate coming from the pyruvate. Okay? And in the next one, we have E3 where FAD is the cofactor and NAD plus is the substrate. Now, the advantages of having this multi enzyme complex is that usually for other reactions that we have been seeing for glycolysis or that we will see for the Krebs cycle have a single enzyme that acts on it. This complex is a multi enzyme complex and the utility of the multi enzyme complex actually shows how important the formation of acetyl CoA actually is and how tightly it has to be regulated as well. Okay? So, what happens when we have this multi enzyme complex is we have a higher rate of reaction because the product of one enzyme actually acts as the substrate for the next enzyme. So, as soon as E1 acts, E2 will come into the picture, then E2 acts and E3 comes into the picture. So, we have a series and assembly line actually going on where we have the product of one being the substrate of the next enzyme making the reaction go faster in a sense because the enzyme itself does not have to get back to its original form right at that point. We also have minimum side reactions and which is most important coordinated control of what is going on in the reaction. So, the overall reaction is pyruvate getting into acetyl coenzyme A with the release of carbon dioxide with this enzyme. Okay. So, these are the three complex the three enzymes E1, E2, E3 and these are the three prosthetic groups that are attached to the specific enzymes. Okay. TPP, lipoamide, FAD to E1, E2, E3 that is these three enzymes that comprise the PDC, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Okay. Now, in E1, you all remember that when we did, when we studied vitamins, we had vitamin B1 thiamine that actually formed TPP. Okay. In TPP, we have an acetic H plus and if you remember, we spoke about this acetic H plus and how it is important in certain reactions and we will see how it is important in this one. So, we have this acidic hydrogen that actually dissociates from the ring and creates a carbon ion. Okay? This negative then attacks the, what happens here? This attacks then the carbonyl of the ketone of pyruvate resulting in the release of carbon dioxide. So, what, what have you have, what do you have here and here? You have CH3CO, that is the acetyl. Okay? So, the acetyl is formed with the help of TPP that is part of E1 of the PDC, that is the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Okay? In the second part, we actually have a lipoic acid that is linked to lysine in the enzyme E2 and here we have a certain reaction which is go going to get into the reduction of this disulfide, the vicinal disulfide here where we have an SHSH that is going to be dihydrolipoamide. Okay? Now, the reason why we are going through this is because we have to understand how acetyl CoA is actually being formed. We have acetate now we have got the rather the acetyl now, right? where did the acetyl come from? It came from E1 where what happened to E1 in the previous step? We, we released CO2 and we had acetyl that is now linked to this, fine. So, now we have to go on in our further steps. This is the part where we have the dithiol that undergoes oxidation and reduction. One important thing of this is this dithiol reacts as with the lipoic acid with the lysine of the, where is this lysine? It is present in E2 okay? and this is the prosthetic group that is present with E2 and this actually invo is involved in the 
the acet acetyl acetyl part the CH 3 CO part actually gets linked to this S in the reaction. Okay, but we are not going into the mechanistic details of this. One important thing that you might want to know is about how this SH, SH that is formed that dihydrolipoamide is actually sometimes you hear about arsenic poisoning. Okay, what happens is this is what gets into inhibiting this lipoamide containing enzymes. So, what happens is your acetyl CoA is not produced. Okay, because it acts on the enzyme E2, this is what happens with arsenic poisoning. And if you, um, if you read a bit of the history of this, there was a certain tonic that was supposed to be made that actually uh, sort of, uh, you know what a tonic will sort of give you more energy in a sense. And that actually, actually led to arsenic poisoning. Charles Darwin in fact died of arsenic poisoning. And this is the mechanistic uh, thing that happened where this compound was actually formed that prevented what? Prevented the dehydrogenase complex from acting, preventing the formation of acetyl CoA, preventing the complete degradation of the glucose. Okay? Then we also have FAD, FAD is part of enzyme part E3. Okay? So, we have E1 that is TPP, E2 that is that lipoamide and E3 that is our FAD. Okay? So, basically what is happening? We have coenzyme A that is the thiol with the acetic acid forming acetyl CoA and the final electron acceptor because FAD is going to get to FADH2, okay? but it has to get back to FAD so that it can react again. So, the final electron acceptor is NAD plus that is the substrate for enzyme E3 that will take up the H2 that has been given to FAD and get it back to FAD. Okay. So, FAD forms FAD plus uh, FADH2 here and this to get this back to FAD what must happen? This has to be taken up by something. Okay. Who is going to take it up? NAD plus is going to take it up in the third reaction. So, ultimately the electron acceptor is the NAD plus which, which is why it is mentioned that NAD plus is a substrate for that particular mechanism. Okay. This is essentially what is happening. The yellow one here is E1 this green one is E2 and the pink one here is E3. What the first step as we saw is we have the TPP, the TPP, let us just get this so that I show you. Okay. So, here we have the loss of this carbon dioxide. Okay. Carbon, this is carbon dioxide which is coming off here. Right. We have now, an acyl part, so this acyl part is linked to where? To the TPP, right? Because you have that elide formation there. So, we have the acetyl part linked to the TPP, which then transfers it to the lipoic acid part that is connected to the lysine in the enzyme E2. So, this is the lysine. So, we see that you see the lysine here, and what, what are these chains? These are the lipoic acid chains. Can you see the lipoic acid chains? These are the lipoic acid chains that have the dithiol and the dithiol one of them picks up the acetyl and has it linked to the sulfur of the lipoamide, right? the lipoic acid part here. Now, what happens is coenzyme A now comes into the picture. Coenzyme A now has to form acetyl CoA. So, it picks up this acetyl forming acetyl CoA and then you have the reduced SHSH. Now, what must happen for this to act again? This has to get back to the dithiol there. So, two of, two of these H's have to be removed. How can they be removed? They are removed by FAD. FAD then comes into the picture, picks up the two hydrogens and this gets back to your oxidized lipolysine, lipolysine. Is that clear? So, this is just a generic procedure where you would have these to because you realize that you have the acetate formed here directly already, but you have to have these enzymatic steps to get the enzymes back to where they started from so that they can go and act on another piduvate. Eventually, what happens is this gets 
to the oxidized part. So, this can now take up another acetyl, another acyl rather. Okay. So, another acyl can now get attached to this. FAD has now been reduced to FADH2. What must happen in this case? FADH2 has to get back to FAD. So, what comes into the picture then? NAD plus. NAD plus then acts as this and picks up the hydrogen. Fine. So, that is basically the whole procedure that gets from your pyruvate to your acetyl CoA. This acetyl CoA is now going to enter the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Okay? Now, let us see what happens. Okay. So, there we have acetyl coenzyme A, which is a product of the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction and it is a central compound in metabolism. And you see how carefully nature has decided on its formation. Okay? with all these E1, E2, E3 specific cofactors acting on it and so on and so forth. Now, what happens is this thioester linkage right here makes it an excellent donor for the CH3CO group. So, whenever you have acetyl coenzyme A come into the picture, you know you will have a transfer of two carbon atoms okay? because you have one carbon atom from the CH3, one from the CO. Okay? So, now we have to think of there has to be a regulation of this complex as well okay, for the complex to act correctly. Now, when we have E3, NADH competes with NAD plus for binding to E3. So, it is inhibited by the product. E3, where did E3 come into the picture? We had FAD going to FADH2, right? And since NAD plus came into the picture there to form NADH, it competes with NAD plus for binding. So, it is inhibited by the product and acetyl CoA competes with coenzyme A for binding to E2, okay? where this acetyl CoA was a product of the enzyme E2. So, we now have product inhibition by NADH and acetyl CoA and this as I mentioned is the overall reaction. Now, the resulting inhibition of the pyruvate dehydrogenase prevents muscles and other tissues from catabolizing glucose and gluconeogenesis precursors. So, basically this it is just a regulation of the whole system. Okay? This product inhibition you have to recognize is a regulation of the whole enzymatic procedure. So, this is what we have. We have pyruvate glucose getting to pyruvate and now we have acetyl CoA that is going to be the input to Krebs cycle where this acetate is going to be broken down into carbon dioxide okay? and we are going to have this acetyl CoA also involved in other components where they for the synthesis of fatty acids, ketone bodies and cholesterol, but that is beyond what we are going to do. We need to know that acetyl CoA is going to the Krebs cycle and we need to know what is going on in the Krebs cycle. Okay. This is acetyl CoA. If you remember, we have the acetyl group here, the beta mercaptoethylamine part, the pantothenic acid part that was derived from the vitamin and what is this part? What is this part? What part is this? Adenine. We have a phospho part here also. You have to go check it up. So, this is acetyl coenzyme A. Now, what do we have here? We have the basic features of the citric acid cycle where we have the PDC and its control, reactions of the TCA cycle and we have as I mentioned before the reactions of glycolysis that are localized in the cytosol and these take place in the mitochondria, Okay, the matrix and the Respiration, the ultimate oxidative phosphorylation takes place in the inner mitochondrial membrane. These are the enzymes. There are eight reactions going on here. We have citrate synthase, aconitase. We will go step by step in each of these like we went for glycolysis. In the first step, we have acetyl CoA, oxaloacetic acid in the presence of citrate synthase. What does citrate synthase mean? It is going to form citrate. 
So, we have oxaloacetate here that has now one thing when you consider or study the citric acid cycle, you have to keep count of the carbon atoms okay? and you have to keep count of what is going where. Okay? So, if you label any of these, this is how these reactions were actually deciphered. If you labeled say the acetyl this carbon, which carbon dioxide it was forming can be determined. right? So, you have to, so when we have this acetyl CoA and we have oxaloacetate, acetate, oxaloacetate has 4 carbon atoms. We are adding acetyl to it. So, now this has 6 carbon atoms, okay? 4 from your oxaloacetate and 2 from the acetyl part of acetyl CoA. So, now we have synthesized citrate using citrate synthase. Okay? So, now we have citrate, we have aconitase that is nothing but an isomerase that forms isocitrate where you have just the interchanging of the H and the OH on carbon atoms 1 and 2 here. Okay? So, you have citrate to isocitrate. Now, actually the delta G0 prime if you see here is a positive quantity. Okay? But since there is some equilibrium, any little bit of this that is formed is pushed into forming going into the next step. So, eventually what does happen is the reaction is going in the forward direction because the product is being removed. Okay? So, that is our second step. So, our first step was the formation, formation of citrate by citrate synthase. The next step is the formation of isocitrate. The third step is isocitrate dehydrogenase. What does that mean? It means it is going to remove now water. We have H plus removed here in NAD and in some cases there are actually two forms of the enzyme that are called two isoforms of the enzyme. One of them prefers NAD plus as the cofactor, one of them prefers NAD plus as the cofactor. Okay? But both of them would ultimately result in the removal of these two hydrogens and the CO2 here. So, you have to remember that if your acetyl carbon atoms were labeled, they would not be in the carbon dioxide released here because this is still there. Okay? So, we now have formed alpha keto glutarate. This is glutaric acid. We have alpha, this is the keto part. So, alpha keto glutarate. So, that is our third step. The fourth step is alpha keto glutarate dehydrogenase. Again, we have NAD plus and NADH. Now, NADH is being formed here and we will later on when I show you the whole cycle, we have to keep count of how many NADH are being formed, how many FADH2 are being formed and how many ATP are being formed because that is going to tell us how much energy we are going to get. Okay? It is not as difficult or as complicated as, as it seems. It is pretty simple actually if you just follow the steps around the cycle. So, what we have here is we have alpha ketoglutarate going to succinyl coenzyme A. Okay? It, these are just cycles. It's just like this, is, this has less steps than the glycolysis cycle, okay? 8 compared to 10. Okay. Then we have succinyl coenzyme A go to succinate and this is the step that results in the production of GTP, the high energy bond. Okay? So, it is the step succinyl CoA synthetase where it has a thioester bond, a high energy thioester bond that actually forms GTP from GDP plus PR. Okay? So, we have succinyl CoA going to succinate. Step number 6 is succinate dehydrogenase where you see how we are getting smaller and smaller. The succinate is now, we have looked at this enzyme before when we looked at FAD going to FADH2. If you remember, when I mentioned how FAD goes to FADH2, we consider succinate going to fumarate and in this case, we have the removal of two hydrogen atoms here. Okay? 
and this is in the inner mitochondrial membrane and it happens spontaneously. Okay? So, we now have formed fumarate. We now how many carbons do we have now? 4. How, much, how many did citrate have? 6. The citrate that we consider and we will show you the here. The citrate had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oxaloacetate that we started off with had 4. We added 2 carbons to make it 6. Okay? Then we had we still had 6 because we have gone to just an isomeric form of it. Then we lost a carbon here. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 now. Okay? Then we lost a carbon here. In alpha cleater in forming succinyl CoA we lost another carbon. So, we are now down to 4. So, now we still have 4 from succinyl CoA to succinate. We still have 4 because we have just gone for a dehydrogenase. Fumarate to malate. This is fumarase okay, where we have H2O forming malate. Then we have malate back to oxaloacetate. Finished. So, you have oxaloacetate that is ready to pick on another acetyl CoA to form what? Citrate. So, that is the whole cycle. Okay. So, eventually what we have is if we look at the overall steps, we have to now figure out where the NADH were formed. Okay. So, let us go back. Let us go back and in the first step, we do not have any production of NADH. Okay? So, in step number 1, we have formed citrate. Step number 2, we still do not have NADH formed. We have just an isomerase reaction going to isocitrate. Step 3, we have lost CO2. We have produced one NADH. So, we keep track of that. Okay? So, we have formed one NADH. In the fourth step, we have another NADH, so two. In this step, we have one GTP that has to be kept count in another counter. Okay? So, we have another counter for GTP and ATP production because G this GTP is ultimately form forms ATP. Okay? We have one FADH2. Okay? So, 2 NADH, 1 FADH2, 1 GTP, then another NADH. So, how many do we have now? We have 3 NADH, let us just keep track of it. We have NADH, we have 3, FADH2, we have 1 and GTP, we have 1. So, these are all coming from our TCA cycle. Okay? Now, the, this NADH and FADH2, where is it going to go? It is going to go for oxidative phosphorylation in the production of ATP. And when we looked at the overall reactions of <coughs> oxidative phosphorylation, what happened to NADH and FADH2? NADH had a reaction in which it produced approximately 2.5 ATP and this produced approximately 1.5 ATP and this is 1 ATP. So, that is an energy, this is per NADH. Okay? So, we will get back to the energy calculations once we complete this. So, now we figured out that in the 8, so because we are back to oxaloacetate now, so we have 3 NADH produced, 1 FADH2 produced and 1 ATP say. So, here is our whole cycle. Acetyl CoA comes into the picture from citrate, from oxaloacetate, from citrate, isocitrate, NADH produced. Okay? So, here is 1 NADH. So, we have oxaloacetate, how many carbons here? 4. How many carbons here? 2. 6. Right? We still have 6. We have lost 1, 5. Lost another 1, 4. 4, 4, 4. Okay? Where how many NAD do we have? 1 NADH, 2 NADH, 3 NADH. How many ATP? 1. 
GTP is it is converted to ATP because guanine and adenine they are uh, both are purines and we have 1 FADH2. Okay? So, that is our count. What else do we have to remember? That from glucose I got 2 of these. So, the whole thing is going to happen twice because glucose gave me 2 pyruvate and this is happening to each pyruvate. When I had glucose, well I, ha I have the steps for you just in simple carbon atom steps. Okay, so, this is just the same thing just showing you where the reactions or where, where what is happening. Okay, now, we figured out what we have. So, now we have to look at the conservation of energy of oxidation in the carb citric acid cycle. We have two carbon acetyl groups generated in the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. There is complete oxidation of two carbons during one cycle. You saw that we had two CO2s being released. Okay? The two carbon atoms which enter the cycle become part of the oxaloacetate for the next cycle. The two carbon atoms that have entered in the top, the CO2s are lost in from the middle, the, what was existing in the oxaloacetate. Okay? Remember I showed you where the CO2s are coming off. Okay? Those CO2s are not part of the acetyl CoA. The acetyl CoA shifts and in the formation, the two carbon atoms which enter the cycle become part of the oxaloacetate and they are released in the third round. Okay? So, you have got to keep track because they come down the one after the other. So, that is how it is being released. Okay. And the energy released due to the oxidation is conserved in the reduction of 3 NAD plus 1 FAD and the synthesis of 1 GTP molecule which is converted to ATP. Okay? So, this is our stage 1. 6 carbon atoms, we had 2 ATP remember that were taken up in the formation of 2 steps there for the glucose 6 phosphate and for the 1 6 base phosphate. So, we had 2 ATP break it, broken down into 2 ADP. Now, so we now have this what, what were these two? Dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, right? So, both of these still have the phosphate. Then we had NADH being produced and we had 2 ATP being produced. Remember then we said that since we had 4 ATP here and 2 ATP being used up, we eventually had 2 ATP to consider. Fine. So, that is our stage 1 of our glycolysis. Now, there are two other possibilities here where we can have lactic acid fermentation. In that case, remember we said that we do not have that NAD, NAD plus because this NAD plus is being utilized again in the reaction. This is what we did in our last class. We also have alcohol formation that happens in yeast. Right? In the fermentation where we are alcoholic fermentation where the pyruvic acid. So, we have to look at the fate of pyruvic acid. Okay? So, what is happening? Say in this case glucose is forming pyruvic acid. Now, the pyruvic acid can get into forming acetyl CoA that is going to be part of the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Now, this is also happening where you have lactic acid formation that usually is an anaer anaerobic form which happens a lot in the muscles, the skeletal muscles. Then we also have this form where we will have alcohol fermentation in the formation of ethyl alcohol that is usually formed in yeast. Now in the Krebs cycle we have this, where all the rest of it come. So we have NAD plus going to NADH. So the pyruvic acid in this case forms acetate. This acetate then forms acetyl CoA and the acetyl CoA then from the coenzyme A will ultimately give us acetyl CoA. This acetyl CoA is going where? To the Krebs cycle. Okay? So, this is where we have our Krebs cycle where our input is going to be acetic acid. Then we have a phosphate come in. We have ADP plus phosphate 3 NAD plus and 1 FAD. Okay? And the output is? Two carbon dioxides, two are formed in two steps. We have ATP being formed, 
3 NADH being formed, 1 FADH2 being formed. Okay? So, now we have to count. So, we have we had 6 carbons. Where did the 6 come from now? Oxaloacetate provided 4, acetyl provided 2. Okay? Then we lost CO2 along the cycle and we came back to 4. Fine? So, that is our Krebs cycle. Then in stage 3, it is just our NADH and all the electron transport chain finally forming ATP okay, in our oxidative phosphorylation steps which we have done before. So, now we have to look at our balance sheet. This is what we did last time. Glycolysis, we have 2 ATP that are used up, 4 ATP produced. Why? Because we have 2 3 carbon fragments, each of them are producing 2, so we have 4 ATP produced. So, eventually we have a net production of 2 ATP per glucose. Okay, this is what I showed you last time. So, this is basically now our balance sheet. So, we have now, this is the carbon. So, we have in our first steps, we have glucose going to glucose 6 phosphate. What did that do? It took away an ATP. So, let us if we talk in terms of ATP, it is minus 1. Fine. What was our next step? Fructose 6 phosphate to fructose 1 6 base phosphate. That also took away another one. Fine. Then we have We'll, this is all the ATP we are considering now, then we will get back to our, then we have the bisphospho, the bis that is the 1, 3 bisphosphoglycerate, 1, 3 bisphosphoglycerate, what did that form? That formed the phosphoglycerate, phosphoglycerate and what happened there? It was plus 2 actually because we have 2 of the 3 carbons now, fine. Then from the phosphoglycerate, we form the phosphoenol pyruvate. The phosphoenol pyruvate gave you the pyruvate, okay. So, we have the phosphoenol pyruvate give you the pyruvate plus 2, fine. So, eventually we have plus 2. That is amount of ATP from glycolysis, that is what we figured out. Now, when we have 2 pyruvate, because we have to remember that 1 glucose is giving us 2 pyruvate, we cannot forget that. 2 pyruvate to 2 acetyl CoA, in that step we have 2 NADH. Okay? In this step, remember when we have pyruvate go to acetyl CoA in the complex, what happened to NAD plus? The last step in E3 where FADH2 had formed, we had NAD plus go to NADH2, remember? So, we have, let us keep track of our NADH now. So, NADH and FADH2. So, before we enter the Krebs cycle, we have the 2 pyruvate, 2 pyruvate going to 2 acetyl CoA because remember 2 pyruvate comes from the glucose. So, how many NADH does that mean? 2 NADH. So, let us just in fact let us let us write NADH here because all are NADH except one. So, we have 2 right. Then we have in our other steps we consider how many NADH do we finally get in the Krebs cycle. I am not writing the steps. The Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle gives us 3 NADH. Then FADH2 we have. 1 FADH2. So, this is actually we should have probably NADH 
1 F A D H 2. So, this is for N A D H, this is 1 F A D H 2 and 1 A T P. And what do we get from glycolysis? We got and what about N A D H? Why? There is one step that provided here yeah, exactly you get 2 NADH which was the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate going to the base phosphoglycerate. So, we got ATP from glycolysis 2 and NADH from glycolysis 2. We just have to go and look at the series of steps. Okay? <coughs> so, now we have to what else do we know from oxidative phosphorylation? that each NADH is going to give me 2.5 ATP, each FADH2 is going to give me 1.5 ATP. So, calculate how many ATP you are supposed to get from this information, tell me. So, NADH I have 5. NADH actually I have 5 and 2, 7, FADH 2, I have 1, ATP I have 3. Pyruvate to acetyl CoA we have 2, Krebs cycle we have 3, but we are missing out something here. This has to be multiplied by 2, and this has to be multiplied by 2, and this has to be multiplied by 2. Why? They are 2 each, right. So, how many do we have? How many do we have? So, we have 2 8 here and 2 10. So, 10 into 2.5 25, 2 into 1.5 and 4 ATP. How many? 32. So, I have 32 what? ATP. How much energy is that? Do you know how much energy it is? So, usually they say we have 30 to 32. Okay, let us get back to the slides here. Then this is actually the whole balance sheet. Okay? We have a num the number of ATP or reduced coenzymes that are directly formed from each step and the number of ATP that are ultimately formed. So, we have a count of exactly what we did where we consider all the NADH, all the FADH2, all the possible ATP and we finally got 32. Okay? They say 32, 32 because they have considered this as 3 to 5, but 32 ATP is fine. Okay. So, if we consider the efficiency of the biochemical engine in the living systems, the oxidation of one glucose yields 2840 kilojoules per mole of energy. Okay? That is a huge amount of energy and the energy obtained by this biological engine is 32 ATP into 30.5 kilojoules per mole. That is the ATP hydrolysis, remember 31 kilojoules. So, that is the amount of energy we can get for the 32 ATP that are generated where from your glycolysis, from your Krebs cycle and your oxidative phosphorylation. So, in all cellular respiration, the whole three steps that we considered stage 1, stage 2, stage 3 ultimately leads to the production of 32 ATP. Okay? 
this 32 ATP then gives us the energy for the functioning of the cell, the functioning of all the reactions that are actually going on in the body. Now, if we consider the efficiency, okay, we actually get 34 percent efficiency if we consider the calculations done in standard conditions. Standard conditions meaning that we would have 25 degree centigrade, but if we actually consider the cellular conditions where we are going to consider the overall efficiency in terms of a temperature of 37 degrees centigrade, we will get an efficiency of 65 percent. Okay? So, from all the enzymatic reactions that go on in the body, we get a large amount of energy based on the production of ATP that is going coming from the metabolism of the carbohydrates that is the formation of glucose from where? From glycogen that is stored in the river, liver, glucose going into pyruvate, pyruvate forming acetyl CoA, acetyl CoA getting into the Krebs cycle producing NADH and FADH2 that is then going to go into the oxidative phosphorylation and the whole electron transport system where complexes 1 through 4 are going to utilize these cofactors into creating the proton pump that is going to pump protons into the intermembrane space in the mitochondria ultimately leading to the production of ATP. So, we found out that this is the amount of energy that we can get and this completes our discussion on the breakdown of glucose to carbon dioxide and water. So, that will complete our metabolism and basically the essence of what we were supposed to do for this course. Thank you.